This is going to be verse by verse of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to look at first the subject of while you're waiting. Many people are just waiting on the rapture and not doing anything while they're waiting. So let's talk about some things to do while you're waiting. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And first look at verse 7. It says, So that ye be, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at some things you need to do while you're waiting. That is, waiting for the rapture. Some people don't do anything while they wait. You see people all the time in the doctor's office just sitting there doing absolutely nothing while they wait. All while they could be reading the Bible, doing something beneficial, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You can always pick up a Bible and read it. Don't sit around idle while you wait on your ride or while you wait at the doctor. If you're a Christian, you're waiting for the rapture, but while you wait, you need to do some things. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to pick you up. And in Luke 19, 13, he says, Occupy till I come. So Paul says, Redeem the time because the days are evil. So while you wait, do something. Number one, while you wait, start some type of ministry. You may not be a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, but you can start some form of ministry to put out the gospel, to put out the words of God, to edify other believers. In 1 Corinthians 1, in verse 1, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother. So Paul, formerly named Saul before he got right with the Lord, is a God called apostle. He wasn't called by man but by the Lord. And in Galatians 1 and verse 1, he says he is an apostle not of men neither by man. And Romans 11:13 says he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Even though he has a heavy burden for his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jewish people. So this is his ministry. And he said in Romans 9, 3, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So he had a burden for lost people. And in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, he said, I am the least of the apostles. So you see, he isn't puffed up in his ministry. He wasn't concerned about who would be the greatest, like they were doing in Mark 9, 34. And there are all kinds of ways to reach people. And that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to reach the lost. And there's all kinds of ways to reach people in 2019, even more ways. So many different ways to put out the gospel. Sit down and pray about it and think of something that you can do for the Lord. Occupy till he comes. So 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother. Many men wonder what the will of God is for their life, and instead of waiting on an answer to that question, go ahead and do what you already know is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 22, 16 through 22 gives you some things to do. It says, Rejoice every more. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. So do what you know God wants you to do while you pray and wait for you know, the Lord to lead you into something for a ministry. Ephesians 6, 5 through 7 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So, read the Bible, pray, go to work, provide for your family, get around other Christians, try to get somebody saved. These things are the will of God. And if you do these things, then maybe the Lord will show you something. Maybe He'll lead you to something that you can do for Him. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. And to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, 
with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So, number two, while you wait, get together with other Christians and wait together. When you are trying to patiently wait, most people naturally like to wait with somebody else. Now, I'm kind of a loner, but if I'm waiting somewhere, I do want my family with me. And you need to realize other Christians are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul says in verse 2 that he is writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So as much as my loner self likes to get a good commentary or topical book or the Bible itself and get alone, being an isolated Christian is not biblical. And there is a lot of talk today about how the Christian needs to isolate himself. But this is the devil's way of dividing and conquering. I have the temptation of isolation myself, and I'm sure many of you do too, but when you read these Pauline epistles, you can clearly see over and over that believers need to meet together. As he says in verse 2, "...to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours." Now, this church of God isn't talking about the church of God denomination. And it definitely isn't talking about the church of Christ cult. And in Romans 16, Paul says the churches of Christ salute you. And many churches of Christ followers will claim that this is talking about their works religion, their little cult that they have. But it doesn't say the church of Christ in Romans 16. It says the churches of Christ, talking about more than one church. But the church in the Bible is made up of every born again believer. And when you got saved, you were put into the church. In 1 Corinthians 12:13 it says, "For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit." So the church is this one body that we are baptized into. Colossians 1:24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So the body is the church. And now the church of God, which is at Corinth. You see, there's a local church in Corinth, a local group of believers that are a part of a little assembly. And in the Bible, you have churches, which is many groups of believers, and then you have the church, which is made up of every born-again believer. But you can't get around the fact that Paul teaches fellowship with others, and he does not teach isolation from others. And there have been times in my life where I wish it did teach isolation. But don't listen to these guys who are such loners and have such a problem getting along with other people that they force the Bible to teach this thing of isolation and that you need to get away and just stay away from other Christians because you're just so much more right with all these you're just so much more right with God than all these other Christians are that's not biblical at all now verse 2 unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours so both theirs and ours that is them which are in Corinth and saints everywhere else. And if you're sanctified, then you're set apart. You were set apart once and for all when you got in Christ the moment you believed. And then there's a different sanctification that has to do with your daily walk where you set apart yourself from the world every day and act like a Christian. Now that second sanctification has nothing to do with your salvation because you were sanctified once and for all when you believed the gospel. But that second sanctification has to do with your fellowship with God and how you're living in this flesh. That is, if you're a Christian, you need to be set apart from the world. While you're waiting, act like a Christian. Because Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul says... You're called to be saints in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Every born-again believer is a saint. And notice this letter isn't just for the people in the church at Corinth. It's for everyone in every place who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. So it's also for me and you. 
Now verse 3, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like to say the Lord's full name, the Lord Jesus Christ, not J.C., but the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God-man, God manifested in the flesh. And that's who I'm waiting on, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And each part of his name has some meaning. Because Colossians 2, 9 says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Lord, call him Lord because he is deity. Call him Jesus because he's the Son of God and Christ showing the Holy Spirit, the anointed. God is one in three and three in one. The Godhead ha has three distinct persons, yet they are one. But Paul says, Grace be unto you and peace. And the Lord has more than just saving grace. He gives you he gives you grace for every occasion. He gives you grace to grow. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And He gives you peace if you lean on Him. Philippians 4.7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now next, while you're waiting, thank God for the opportunity to serve. In Acts 5.41 it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they, can't, they rejoiced in the fact that they could be made fun of and put in jail and everything else just because they wanted to preach Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.4 I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. In verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So the Lord didn't just give him grace to be saved, as in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. But he also gave them grace to be enriched in all utterance. So while you're waiting on the rapture, thank God that he counted you worthy to have utterance in preaching the gospel. In Ephesians 6, 19, it says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Colossians 4, 3, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Mark sixteen fifteen says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So while you're waiting, preach the gospel and open your mouth boldly for Jesus Christ. Now verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So the Lord gave the Corinthian church utterance, which has to do with the ability to witness to others about the gospel. And he gave it. He gave them knowledge, and Paul later on tells them that knowledge puffeth up. He also gives you grace to be enriched in all knowledge. So, like I said, that verse in Second Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's only by the grace of God that we have an opportunity to open a King James Bible and read it and grow in the knowledge of God. And while you're waiting, read the Bible. I'm trying to stuff my mind with as many verses and as many doctrines and as many Bible stories and as many Proverbs and Psalms and as much of God I can. I'm trying to cram all that in my head as much as I can before the rapture. And then I'm ready to Senator Jesus teach to me as he teaches me in the Millennial Kingdom. 1 Corinthians 1, six says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So the Corinthians were a bunch of baby Christians, but they had the testimony of Christ confirmed in them. And Re Revelation 19.10 says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if you have the testimony of Christ in you, then you can prophesy, and that you know where you're going when you die. The moment you get saved, you know that you're going to heaven. You're telling your own future. You're saying, I'm saved, so I'm going to heaven when I die in the future. Now verse 7. It says, So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God gives us the grace to come behind in no gift. God gives you the grace to perform what He wants you to perform with your life until His appearing where you will meet Him in the air. And you have some kind of gift from the Lord and you can use the gift. Just don't misuse it. If it is a gift where you're giving glory to God, you're using it right. If you're using it to get glory for self, then you're using it wrong. If you're using it 
to give glory to the devil, then you're definitely doing it wrong. Now verse 8, it says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? So the Lord is going to confirm me unto the end. He is able to keep me from falling and to present me faultless. I'm in his hand and nobody can pluck me out. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. As Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, He'll never leave me nor forsake me. So verse 8 said, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That day of our Lord Jesus Christ, referring to the judgment seat of Christ. After I go through that and the Lord judges me for the things done in the body, then I'll be completely blameless. I'm already blameless in the sense that I have Christ's righteousness and my eternal destination is fixed. And I'm already sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, spiritually speaking, as we speak. But at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord is going to judge me about my service. What have I done for Him in the body? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So when it comes to your flesh, it's not blameless unless you're keeping it under subjection to the Holy Spirit. When you're doing that, it is, but most of the time you're probably not. And when it comes to the new man in you, you are blameless. So, this here is talking about our daily walk with the Lord while we are on this earth. So he says that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you want to arrive at that judgment seat with as good of a Christian service as you can possibly have. So while you're waiting, do something for God. And verse 9 says, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God is faithful while you're waiting you don't have to worry if he's coming to get you or not. God is faithful. While you're waiting, think about the comfort of the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, it's a comfort to know that while you're waiting, that your hope is a sure thing. It's not a, I hope so. It's your hope because you know so.